colleagues, dear participants, it's a great pleasure to be here. I was asked a few months ago by Margarita Nordin to come here to Botswana and I didn't know nothing about this country. Uh, I also didn't know about the World Spine Care so much. And so I arrived uh, Monday and I learned so much and I uh, was highly surprised and impressed by the work of the World Spine Care people. I really uh, admire what they started here. And uh, secondly, uh, I was also impressed uh, through my uh, visit, uh, visits uh, at the clinics, what I uh, saw. The infrastructure will allow quite fast also surgery, uh, spine surgery and complex uh, spine surgery in this country. By the way, I feel very happy to be in Botswana. You are very friendly people and uh, you can feel it and it's quite, not only quite, it's just peaceful here. So I start with uh, my difficult uh, topic. You know, we are the hardware guys. 10% we treat, uh, fortunately, only 10% of the uh, low back pain uh, people. And uh, among this 10%, we select very carefully. I just want to give you a picture where I'm working. I'm from Switzerland, as you know. I work in Aarau and in Zurich. That's quite close together, 45 minutes. That's the clinic. And uh, here you see how we do these live surgery events uh, uh, with uh, re uh, video conferencing uh, to America and so on. Here, that's a very important point. You see our team, that are, are not all surgeons. This is an interdisciplinary team with rheumatologues, with pain therapists, with psychologues, neurologues, and more complex cases with low back pain, not the clear cases. We discuss every week uh, uh, together so that we can improve the quality, especially in this difficult uh, patient group. These are figures. Uh, from the industry. Uh, that's the expectations of the, how much uh, uh, implants in instrumented fusion worldwide uh, was uh, sold. And here you see the importance of the uh, degeneration. And you see it's 74% uh, compared to the deformity with 15 tumor trauma with 11%. Um, the indications and the operative technique is well defined in these groups, tumor trauma and deformity. In the degenerative conditions, there are a lot of approaches, a lot of ways to Roma, and if you visit 10 doctors, you will get at least seven different answers which way you have to go for instrumented fusion in degenerative conditions. So if we want to make a successful surgery, we have to know the pain source. Without that, we will not have a good outcome. This is a little bit simplified, but as you know, we surgeons, uh, <laughs> we are sometimes perhaps a little bit simple. Uh, not too intellectual because we have to do the practical work. So, but this slide shows quite well the interaction between the uh, locomotorious apparatus and the uh, neural structure. You see the potential pain sources, the autogenic pain, that's the disc, the so-called discogenic pain, still not very well defined. Then we have the articular uh, pain, you know, facet arthritis, uh, like uh, hip joint arthritis as a pain source, and even this differentiation between the disc pain, discogenic pain, and the articular pain is not easy. Uh, then we have the neurogenic pain, 
that with this I mean the nerve root pain, that is what the surgeons love, because there we know we will have a very good result in the most of cases. So these are the pain sources. And what I want to show you with this slide is also that you analyze the whole segment, you know, according to the definition of Jung Hans in 1954, who uh, defined the uh, functional spine uh, unit. This is this part of the spine around the disc. It's clear the disc is the key structure of the degenerative process. Already at the end of 20, uh, it starts to be a degenerative process through uh, internal ruptures with an inflammation. Like with the meniscus, it can happen here. And you have these reactions. Then you have at the age between 30 and 50, mainly disc herniation, extruded nucleus, as you can see uh, here. And of course, if the anterior shock absorber, the disc is not working very well, then we also can have a problem in the back side, at the articulation side, because the motion of the articulation is not normal. So here you see the research results, the state of the art. I don't go inside, don't worry. It's just, of course, biomechanical factors. They play an important role. And then the biochemical factors uh, through genetic differences. And with my experience now, I strongly believe this is a very important factor, this genetic uh, differences. So, with all of what I told you, we have to carefully analyze and do an exact preoperative examination uh, because there are different potential sources of pain, and of course, we do the patient history examination, still very important history, especially history examination. Then uh, my radiological colleague, he already uh, spoke about this, that's why I don't repeat this. We need an X-ray, then usually an MRI to show the soft tissues, the disc. But if you want to have uh, clear information about the joint and the bone structure, we need a CT scan. Especially we need a CT scan post-operative in presence of hardware I mean uh, metal implants, but a very important tool in the diagnostic are the uh, injections of the nerve root and the articulations, the facet joints. So we heard this about already, 85% are unspecific low back pain patients, even if they have massive radiological changes. So if we find radiological changes, this means not we have uh, a problem. Uh, we have not uh, necessarily back pain problems. This is shown by this study through Weishaupt. He took 60 healthy individuals and he found these changes. Disc generation in 70%, analog tear in 33%, disc ex extrusions, and even this uh, modic changes, this end blend and plate changes. So they are healthy, they have no pain, but they have uh, changes in the MRI. So we don't operate uh, images, we operate patients. So. <laughs> so, I come to another important remark, just this is always very difficult when the patient comes like this to the surgeon. Low back pain is a problem and we always 
fighting with this in daily practice to find out, especially when there are several segments uh, involved. We prefer the leg pain, the radical, I mean the radical leg pain. So if in these situations we can do a decompression and 80 to 90 percent of the patients are happy. Here you see the fatso joint injections. We uh, do it under uh, fluoroscopic control, as you can see here, directly in the joint, or we uh, inject the nerves. We uh, inject local anesthesia, like you go to the dentist when he is friendly, and <laughs> in the long uh, holding local anesthesis, uh, anesthesiology, uh, you must be pain free in, the, in this time where the local anesthesia works. We also then uh, add uh, steroids, perhaps it helps to, uh, to solve the pain problem for some time or for even always. Then we have some injection technologies for the uh, nerve roots, as you can see here, by catheter, but also directly injections. Uh, the idea is to uh, block the nerve also with uh, local anesthesia on steroids, also to get the information, is the pain really coming from this nerve because in the spine we have always several, also often several locations with uh, compression of the nerve root and then we have to be sure before we operate. This we don't do so, uh, this is very rare, the discography, this we don't, don't do anymore, even test fixation percutaneously, also very, very rare in really desolate situations where we don't know what to do. We have a lot of treatment options, as you can see here. Of course, the most minimal is the decompression, or even the, the but more complex, the uh, uh, physiotherapy, muscle uh, strengthening. Then we have uh, the fusion, the instrumented fusion with metal implants, as you can see here. We have dynamic stabilization systems with shock absorbing uh, connections. We have nucleus replacement uh, devices, not uh, in current used anymore, disappointing results. And we have this prosthesis. This is the future with the steam cell uh, injection. So principally we have uh, these three techniques we have to look at, the decompression, the dynamic fixation as the last option, it's an alternative to the instrumented fusion as you can see here and all these also sometimes have to be combined, all these techniques in one uh, patient. So this is the decompression technique uh, we do it under microscope with a little incision. If we have few segments where we have to decompress, we have a longer incision. We put in this tube or a small retractor and remove the disc. It's the same technique you use also in spinal stenosis. You just don't uh, manipulate the nerve and remove disc materials. But the principle of the operation is the same. Here you see uh, again um, the intraoperative situs. You see this little fenestration. We don't remove anymore the, the, the whole lamina to get access to the spinal canal, not to compromise the stability, the natural stability of the spine. So there is a limited access and approach to the canal uh, under microscope here you see this this herniation uh, by MRI. Some results from Weinstein 
prospective trials, discrectomy versus usual uh, care, and uh, the results were uh, better uh, with significant improvement in the operative group, in the microdiscectomy group versus the usual care. What is the uh, indication in the radical pain? We wait usually six weeks when there is no neurological deficit. If we have a patient with a pain, a leg pain, a neurogenic leg pain that we can really not uh, manage, then we operate immediately. There is no sense to wait too long because uh, the operation is a very little one uh, microsurgical procedure. In presence of a neurological deficit, of course, we operate, especially when it's a functional relevant deficit uh, with a foot drop paralysis, for example, or hamstring paralysis immediately. Uh, yes. So these are the results. You see the Oswestry index. Here, you know, you see the group of the surgery, and here you see the non-operative group. They also did better, but significantly better did the operated group. Here I have to criticize the uh, outcome assessment parameters you, you, they use, because they don't... Uh, take care about the fact that we actually only address the leg pain and these outcome uh, parameters, they don't differentiate between back pain and leg pain. That's why many publications of the discectomy are not so good as we feel as a surgeon because we don't address the back pain. So when they have after six years back pain, that's not, this was not addressed by the surgery. The leg pain was addressed. Do you agree, Margarita? <laughs> okay, so now we have some. Here uh, I come to the decompression techniques uh, in spinal stenosis. I just put you here a picture of a normal canal. You see here the narrowed spinal canal in spinal stenosis, laterally, also centrally. And here you see the interoperative situation uh, through the microscope. You see the nerve root, the dura, and like this it has to be. And also in 80-90% we can guarantee that the patient will be pain-free. That's also a study that uh, showed the improvement in the surgery group over the non-operative uh, group. Now, this is a special situation. We have a spinal stenosis in presence of a dif local deformity, a degenerative spondylolisthesis, as you can see here. The vertebra is slipped. That creates already a uh, stenosis uh, together with the other factors. And there, we don't believe that you can only do uh, decompression. So here you have to stabilize to do an instrumented fusion. And so I come to the instrumented fusion. Some facts. It's a tremendous progress since 1983 when the first implants were uh, used for spinal surgery. Not so long ago. Before they put only bone uh, transplants and the patient had to lie down three, six months. In a, in a plaster and uh, this uh, introduction of metal implants they were a really big progress so in the year there are half million fusions done worldwide around and it's still in discussion of course the golden standard the fusion allows because we create a high primary stability, uh, a rapid mobilization of the patient immediately one day after surgery, 
Of course, he has to fulfill some rules, he has to stand straight, but he can sit immediately and he has a good instructions, but he can be mobilized very rapid. And the metal implants, how you see here, allow an ingrowth of the bone because in every fusion, the final result is defined by the ingrowth of the bone transplant. All implants will fail with time over years when you don't have an ingrowth of the bone transplant. That's a very important uh, thing. What are the goals? What are we doing with the... Why we fuse? And uh, we, of course, want to remove the pain generator. In discogenic pain, we want to remove the disc. In autogenic pain of the, of the joints, we want to immobilize this pain generator. And if we have a, a deformity with eventually a narrowing of the neural foramen, we want to create a, 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 how you say, a, a widening of the neural foramen so that the nerve has enough space. Progress in spinal fusions, I already mentioned this a uh, little bit. Diagnostic tools, of course, the MRI, CT scan, 30 years ago, this was not available. Then a clear segmental analysis, as I told you, you look at the whole segment and not only to the soft tissues. Then the minimized trauma through anterior approach, I will come to, uh, later on this or through percutaneous insertion of screws. And bone substitutes, so that we don't have to harvest bone from the iliac crest, that also can create uh, new problems. So the posterior techniques, you see here insertion of the bone graft, absolutely necessary. This is a picture uh, 1934 already, Cloward did do this technique where he put in between the vertebral bodies, as you can see here, through the canal, that means holding away the neural structure and put in the bone for a bone effusion. This we don't do anymore, now we have this kind of uh, implants called cages that are put or inserted in, in, uh, between the uh, vertebral uh, bodies under protection of the neural structures. Then we have the screw rod systems that secure the fixation posteriorly. Some example, here you see a slippage, here L4 over L5 with the consecutive uh, spinal stenosis, you see here also some liquid in the joint as a sign of the chronic arthritis and this is a clear indication for uh, decompression together with uh, instrumented fusion uh, in presence of leg pain, radical leg pain in if this lady would, would have only back pain, I would not uh, operate her uh, in the moment, so then we would wait. Because it's not sure if the back pain will disappear after the fusion. So the neuroprotective indi indication is the main indication for instrumented fusion also. So you see the result. You put in this cage that you can see here, screw rod system, and you see the anatomical reconstruction. The patient also can stand up the next day. Uh, today they are four or five days in the clinic, and then they go home and have to uh, take care for the restrictions. Another case, that's a, a slippage uh, 
from a different etiology. That means this is a, a disease, a spondylolysis. This means a, a fatigue fracture. Perhaps it's also uh, genetically already uh, um, um, present when you are born. So it comes to a slippage. You see here the end of the sacrum, and you see here it's about uh, over one centimeter slippage. This is a, a very good indication for an instrument infusion, and I show you how we do this nowadays. That's the percutaneous technique. We put in first K wires on the permanent AP and lateral view, how you can see here, so that we are really on the safe side not to ensure the neural structures. Then we have hollowed uh, threadening uh, machine and the hollowed screws and they are inserted like you see here, transpedicular and even the rod can be, uh, can be inserted through these little skin incisions. You be coming back to the case and you see the minimally uh, uh, iatogenic uh, destruction here with these little wounds. This wound, well, this was for the rod and the screws. This was to insert the cage, the intervertebral uh, implant uh, in this situation with this uh, quite uh, big angle, kyphotic angle. Uh, before reduction, of course. You see also the reduction of the deformity. So, we can also approach from anteriorly. You see here the principle. You go anteriorly. The advantage, you can insert much bigger uh, cages with bigger support and a bigger footprint and potentially less subsidence problems as you can see it here and you don't have to manipulate too much at the neural structure compared when you go from posteriorly you can even do a decompression from anteriorly and so it's uh, for the neural structure for the nerves there it's more protection when you go from anteriorly and a last factor the patient support much more uh, the anterior approach from the point of view of the pain than when you go from the back and you uh, uh, incise and uh, destroy the anyway already altered posterior muscle and ligamentous structures. So the principle you go not through the abdomen. Um, I hope you are not too much shocked <laughs> when you see this hand. Actually, this hand has not so much space anymore when we do a little approach. So we go around the abdomen, retroperitoneal. So we uh, uh, don't create potential problems with scarring inside of the uh, abdomen. Here the, the skin incisions, very short, you see this here, transverse, longitudinal. Then uh, intraoperative situation, you have to be uh, a little bit careful for the vessels. In America there are the vascular surgeons, the access surgeons, they only do approaches uh, for, for the whole clinic and that's very interesting. In our country we don't have this, uh, so you need some education in uh, visceral and uh, uh, surgery of the vessels. You need a very good retractor system as you can see here that you always have a, a not shaking assistance. So this is the best assistance in every 
speaks and he stay always in place. <laughs> so, and uh, what's the morbidity of the anti approach? It's very low. This brow, this guy from America, of course, he do only this, but this proves the complication rate is uh, quite low, very low. And uh, I'm also prefer whenever I can to do an anterior approach, as you can see uh, in these examples, where it makes sense when the pathology comes from the anterior side, like you can see here with this local kyphosis of the uh, neurosurgical decompression. This patient still had pain and then uh, came to me and you see this uh, local deformity, discoliosis, and kyphosis, and it was evident to do this from anterior because the pathology is actually anteriorly. Even she has this uh, neurocompression uh, in the MRI, as you can see here on the left side. I didn't decompress, I just went from anteriorly restored the height of the disc space with a cage and put in the screw through the cage and you see after five years the bony ingrows and the position of the segment and the pain, the leg pain disappeared without touching the spinal canal through indirect decompression. That's another case, excuse me, very bad functional X-ray. And uh, you see here slippage on, through, on two levels. And uh, here you see also the spinal stenosis. You don't have to do all the decompression. In this case, she had neurological deficit, by the way, this patient. So a strong indication for decompression. And instrumented fusion. So you see here the result. Again, anterior uh, reconstruction with cages. These cages even allow to put screws through the cages. High primary stability, but secured by posterior instrumentation because I anyway had to decompress from posteriorly. The results of the fusion are in literature a uh, good successful outcome 78 percent but um, it's a little bit optimistic and uh, Margrethe Nording would say these are not class one and two uh, studies if I look at the FDA uh, prospective study where the fusion is compared with the total disc prosthesis they do in both uh, uh, equal with uh, around 67% satisfactory result for discogenic pain. This we have to mention, for discogenic pain. So, and that's what I feel that's correct. That's a little bit optimistic. One argument against uh, the instrumented fusion, and this you hear everywhere, um, is the, the adjacent segment problem. As you can see it here after a fusion, you see the height of the disc, how it incre decreased within five years. But uh, it is a problem, but we will never find out if it's genetically also determined because I saw patient, quite a few, they didn't produce this problem at the neighborhood segment, they pr produced it one segment above. So here we are really in the dust. But this is an argument for the prosthesis, for the disc prosthesis, because the disc prosthesis moves and uh, should potentially avoid the neighborhood segment problem through the maintenance of a mobility. Another advantage of the artificial disc is that we have a second line of defense. We still can do a fusion. That what I think is a, 
a very good option and the post-op treatment is very easy. There is a fast recovery after three months. The people can do actually what they want. Uh, I had mountain climbers. They went back into the mountains and football players, they played again football. That's the big advantage of the disc prosthesis versus uh, the fusion. You see here a last case. You see an instrumented fusion I did for a spondylolysthesis 20 years ago. The patient is now 45 and uh, this time he didn't have cages as you can see but it fused here and she came with this neighborhood problem. You see the disc space is completely narrowed and uh, because of this age I thought to do a prosthesis, not a, uh, again a fusion and the late results now and the five year results they're coming out from uh, the FDA studies they sh show that they are in, there are strong data to support uh, the disc replacement versus fusion it's safe it's at least sa uh, same safety than fusion efficacy is also the same and the costs are also the same and the results, how I told you before, are also the same. So there are not very serious arguments against the total disc replacement, but it's a big debate in Europe and in uh, America. Satis patient satisfaction is high after disc prosthesis. As you can see here, yellow and green, these are all satisfying good results and then you see here the result uh, of surgery in the x-ray of this patient I showed you before with the total disc prosthesis through an anterior approach of course um, so finally we try you see here the invasiveness here on this line, the timeline should be here and of course in low back pain with these exceptions I mentioned we should stay and try physiotherapy, medication but I don't want to go into the conservative field uh, too much uh, then we have an option with the injection injections as a therapy through steroids I think uh, this we should use quite fast. Uh, also to differentiate to the non-specific back pain because how you can tell non-specific low back pain when you have uh, radiography that's clear, then you have to exclude by injections if it's really unspecific. Then we have percutaneous techniques. So you see the uh, it's. Uh, the invasiveness, we try only with little surgery to solve the problem, with minimally invasive surgery, fusion, decompression. Then there is the place of the spine arthroplasty and complex fusion comes at the end. So finally, good judgment, I like this proverb, comes from experience. And experience comes from bad judgment. So, I hope with a lot of education and educational programs we can shorten this, the bad judgment period. Thank you very much for your attention. Questions? Any questions? We have one at the back. I wonder if there's a difference between uh, recurrent discrimination and microdiscation patients versus conservative care patients. Sorry, I didn't understand. Sorry, so with the microdiscectomy or, or micro decompression, 
person who showed the study of microdecompression compression versus conservative care? From Weinstein, the, the um, uh, study. That's right. No, the Weinstein made this study uh, conservative versus uh, microdiscectomy, yes. Right. I wonder if you in that study or in other studies you're aware of that compares the rate of um, reherniation of the disc in those two groups. No, the reherniation are not in the group, they are excluded. It's got no follow up on that. No. I'm no. no. not aware of any study design on that. Yeah. I believe it's, it's probably slightly slightly higher in the conservative. But when you accumulate, as I said, like yeah. 1,000, 2,000 uh, patients, it's not statistically significant. But it's, it's slightly slightly higher in the conservative. Although it's, it's difficult to define recurrence in the conservative group because you have left uh, the hernia disc inside anyway. But if, if it's still on the MRI. If you're talking about recurrence of the symptoms, it's slightly higher in the conservative. We have a further question. Yes? Okay, thank you. I would like to ask uh, when, you, when you have been describing the end part mostly in referring your patients for physiotherapy, I would like you to comment what has been your experience when it comes to failed back uh, surgery syndromes. Failed back syndrome? Yes. Ask me what your experience is. We're going to have a whole talk on failed back syndrome. Uh, Dr. Fisher said is going to talk about failed back syndrome. But, but there are, they are and, uh, uh, but the definition of the failed back surgery syndrome is very difficult. It, de it depends. Let's say the FDA, when you are after a uh, surgery uh, has to do an uh, injection in the post-operative phase, it's already rated under complication. Or another example that I mentioned in the discectomy patients, how you measure, if you only measure the overall result, back and leg pain, and not differentiate leg pain and back pain. You have many patients after discectomy, they still have back pain because you didn't do nothing against this back pain. You only decompressed. So if you measure back pain and leg pain, they have after a few years a bad result. And then it's going on the failed back uh, syndrome. So you see the problem. But of course, uh, instrumented fusion, especially particular fixation, has quite a highly complication rate. 18% malplacement of the screws with the technology we have today. Not all create symptoms. Any other questions? Uh, uh, you mentioned in your presentation about the dynamic fixation. I was curious to know what uh, your indications are about uh, the dynamic fixation of the non fusion techniques, uh, especially the interspinal spacers or the flexible rods that you show the picture. Sorry. If people could just yell and not use the mic. Don't mind, use yell. the microphone. I come close to you and uh, then I understand no. the question. You know, you mentioned about the dynamic fixation uh, systems mm -hmm. on the non-fusion system. I was curious to know what your indications would be. For the 